Today's gospel may very well be the most acrimonious exchange in the whole Bible. Our Lord was disputing with a hostile audience of unbelieving Jews. And you can tell from the tone of the conversation that Christ's days are numbered. It's only a matter of time until his enemies will make up their minds to do away with him. His enemies call him a Samaritan and demon-possessed. It's about the worst insult they could think of. And he responds by calling them liars, sons of Satan, who himself is a liar, like father, like son. All told, hardly a pleasant conversation. In fact, it's kind of hard to imagine gentle Jesus, meek and mild, talking like this to anybody. But we do know from the other Gospels that our Lord did occasionally engage in controversy with his opponents. There are several woe sayings in Matthew and Luke that also show him coming on strong. And there's his blast against the Pharisees when he called them whitewashed tombs. Beautiful on the outside, but full of rock. But still, the conversation in today's gospel can shock. What in our Lord's teaching could have provoked such anger? And what in his audience could have provoked such strong language from Christ? And what does that whole unpleasant exchange have to do with us? Well, let's think about it. First, how did Christ arouse their anger? This text picks up in the middle of a conversation. It began with the Lord addressing some Jews who believed in him. He said, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But after that, things get nasty. His audience insists that they are descendants of Abraham and have always been free. They were insulted that Christ should think they needed to be set free from anything. Of course, if he had offered to free them from the Roman occupation, that might have been a different matter. But here was Christ offering them a blessing from God. Why should they get so heated about such an offer? Well, our Lord diagnoses the issue accurately. They do not know God. They think they know him, but himself they do not know. And because they don't know God, they don't know themselves either. So they sit back in their self-righteous pride and assume that God is delighted with them because they belong to the chosen people. And they really get steamed when our Lord said, before Abraham was, I am. That I am was the divine name that God had revealed to Moses in the burning bush. Obviously, Christ was claiming to be God. Self-sufficiency. God can call himself I am because he can do without anybody else. Humans need other humans to survive. And above all, 
They need God. And Christ is saying they need Him. But then they pick up rocks to start stoning Him for blasphemy. When actually they're committing it themselves by assuming that they are in good shape in the God department. Well, what does all that have to do with us? How can you take a criticism that our Lord applied to unbelievers and apply it to us, to believing Christians? Well, I guess that depends. Just how believing are we? How well do we know God? Those of us who have been through a Lutheran catechism class probably know a lot about God. We know his names. We know his attributes. Remember that one. God is a spirit. He is eternal, unchangeable, omnipotent, means almighty, omniscient, means all-knowing. Omnipresent means he's everywhere. Holy, just, faithful, benevolent, merciful, gracious. I don't know if you had to memorize all of those, but I sure did. We know that he is tri you, three in one. And we accept that even if we don't fully understand it. We know that Jesus is both God and man. We know that the Bible is God's word, and therefore true. All these things, and what's more, we believe them. But guess what? The devil knows all those things too, and he believes them. Doesn't like it, but he believes it. Obviously, there has to be more to the faith than that. If there is, let's use an example. Suppose we have just met. I have looked you up in the parish register and know a lot about you. I know your name. In fact, I know all your names, even the ones you don't use anymore. I know when and where you were born, when and where you were baptized, confirmed, married. I know the names and ages of your children. I know where you live, all your phone numbers. I know where you're employed, what kind of work you do. Does that mean I know you? Not really. I may know where you buy your clothes, what color the carpet is in your living room, what kind of cookies you bake at Christmas, but I don't necessarily know you. I can know a lot about you without knowing you. To put it in short, head knowledge is different from heart knowledge. I would need to be intimately involved with you over a long period of time before I could claim really to know you. But if I'm involved with you at especially important occasions, like if I were to baptize and confirm and marry your kids, counsel with your family, bury your parents, pray at your sickbed, share your grief over a child gone wrong, then I might be able to say that I know you pretty well. And that's what the real knowledge of God, the faith, is like. It's heart knowledge, soul knowledge, as opposed to mere head knowledge. You have to know the facts, of course, but real knowledge, call it intimacy, is ever so much more. 
Christ said, whoever has God for his father listens to the words of God. Real children of God listen to their father's words and let those words correct them, comfort them, and guide them. Concretely, if I believe the Bible is true, that's a good thing. But only when I listen to it, let it speak to my heart, let it correct me, judge me, and lead me to Christ. Only then can I say that I know God, really know him, know him intimately, love him truly, and obey him. How well do we know him? Well, that depends, that can be measured by how well we obey. And if you're anything like me, you probably have to admit that disobeying is more often what we do than what we would really like to remember. And that's why our Lord's words to his unbelieving audience can apply to us, after all, at least to some degree. I doubt if he would call us liars and children of Satan, unless we absolutely refuse to acknowledge him as Savior and Lord. But to the extent that we fail to let God's word sink in, and to the extent that we ignore its correction, its guidance, to that extent, Christ's words of criticism also apply to us. And that's why, just like that unbelieving audience, we also need his help. His offer of freedom enraged them. It should encourage and comfort us. If anyone obeys my teaching, he shall never know what it is to die. Christ promises us life, eternal life. How can he make such a promise? By dying for us. Death is God's judgment on human sin. Christ bore that judgment on the cross. And now he promises us a share in his risen life. As we gather at the altar to receive his body and blood, he gives us forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. As our baptism brought us to live in Christ, so also the Holy Communion is Christ in us. <laughs> we live in him, he lives in us. How much closer can you get than that? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.